Jay, it's really lovely to have you on the show. Matt, such an honor to be with you at long last. Many people uh, have been trying to connect me to you for probably the last three or four years. So such a delight to be with you today. Thank you. You're a therapist, um, a a Christian minister. That's my understanding. And you've done a lot of work with people who have experienced or do experience sex addiction and porn addiction. Is that right? That is all mostly true. Yes. Okay. Except? Yes. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the main thing that I would say with regard to porn addiction is, you know, I definitely work with a lot of people who would specify, you know, struggling with addiction, but I also work with uh, a lot of individuals that might kind of experience the other side of it where, you know, kind of hyposexual, uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorders, those that don't feel like they can find any desire for their partner or for their sexual life, kind of that sense of, I need a defibrillator for my sex life. So uh, Mm. work with people kind of all across the spectrum of sexual problems that inevitably come up in relationships. What are your thoughts on the term addiction and how would you, (laughs) or if you do, distinguish porn addiction and sex addiction? Uh, So here's what I would say about uh, the word addiction is uh, you will never hear me say that addiction does not exist, Mm -hmm. uh, but you will also routinely hear me say that it is overdiagnosed. And uh, I think it is part of the problem these days is not only the problem of, you know, compulsive porn use, but also the way that we have conceived the problem as kind of Zizek would say. And so I think all of us need to consider um, the, the phrase that I use throughout a lot of my work is the phrase unwanted sexual behavior. And the reason why I landed on that is uh, I think part of what's happening culturally is that you have some uh, addiction therapists who are highly incentivized to be able to see uh, compulsive you know, porn use, extramarital affairs that completely destroy one's life, one's marriage. Uh, and they want to say that it's an addiction uh, and they take a very pathology based understanding of that problem. And then you have people on the other end of the spectrum uh, who would say, stop pathologizing every sexual dysfunction or problem that these are probably these are normal things that people need to eventually learn how to outgrow. And so I think that's the cultural moment that we're in is we either tend to pathologize and stigmatize normal problems that are existing in our world today, or we try to dismiss them as irrelevant and completely normal. And so a lot of my approach is to be able to say that the symptoms of our lives, whether that is, you know, out of control porn use or extramarital affairs, like those symptoms are trying to tell us something about the unresolved dimensions of our life. And so therefore, Uh, a much more kind and curious approach with regard to what is at work uh, is needed. So I I have problems. I'm a middle child, Matt. And so uh, this is kind of, I think I've probably projected this into the world as well. Uh, But I think that that, those seem to be my mother and father, right? Uh, Not in, uh, not literally, but mother and father, but some, framework that just pathologizes and some framework that just normalizes. And I think that both uh, of the ways that we've conceived those issues are part of the problem itself. So uh, we can go as deep into that as you'd like, but I think there are problems that exist, sadly, but I think part of the problem is the way that we have conceived the problem. Mm. That's really interesting. I do want to spend a lot of time talking about how the the type of pornography reveals something maybe unmet in us or something in need of healing. And I love what you said there about more curious and, and less shaming. Uh, but before we get mm-hmm. to that, the kind of deeper yeah. stuff, maybe just want to dwell on this topic for a moment, because I suppose part of the incentive some people have in calling pornography a, an addiction, or at least here's how I would think of it. And I really love your take because you've thought about this much more than me. I know that we can talk about addiction as sort of um, maybe psychological way and people say something like uh, engaging in behaviors that you feel you don't have any control over or something. But I, I also think if we're willing to say that certain narcotics are, or just even like nicotine or methamphetamines are addictive, and you might say, well, mm-hmm. what objective data 
would you have to look at to come to that conclusion? And I would, I would expect that one way to do that might be looking at the brain. And if it's, and so suppose we have some objective data that we can say, okay, this is an addiction. And, and maybe, maybe the term addiction is unhelpful because it makes it sound like you've crossed this threshold and now something totally different is at play. But, but my, my point is if we can say that there are addictions to nicotine or alcohol based on looking at the brain, we, we, we perhaps could, could be able to say the same thing in regards to pornography, since there are a ton of studies out there that seem to match, um, you know, un- unnatural, if you want, addictions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so, so maybe, maybe the reason people like me like to point that out is because I think Pornhub and the sexualized culture would like to say, no, it's, that's insane to say that a natural thing can be addictive in the same way that nicotine can. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's one issue which I'd like you to address, but but then maybe just the issue of like, well, how helpful is the label either way? So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'll take the second point first, and, and I would say that it's a mixed bag. I mean, we want to have a proper diagnosis in order to set up the treatment plan. So if I'm going into a doctor and seeing a cardiologist and I have heart disease, I don't want him coming up with you know other language to try and disguise the point that. Uh, some significant interventions need to be made. And so classically, you know, addiction has been that framework of I am trying to stop something, but I'm not able to. And that behavior, whether that's nicotine, alcohol, uh, porn, infidelity, uh, that is beginning to interfere with my uh, relationship with God and others. Uh, That is interfering with my ability to get work done. It might even be having physiological effects. Mm -hmm. So some of the research that's been done Uh, would say that men under 40, I think in the 1940s or 1950s, when the study was initially done, only about two or three percent of men under 40 had erectile dysfunction. Now, according to the study, you're looking at rates between 20 to 30 percent. And so uh, I think we have to be able to say uh, there are massive issues that porn creates. And again, you won't hear me argue against the language of addiction. I think it exists. But I think culturally, it is often one of those battleground issues. And so one of the things Mm. that I think about sometimes is, uh, I once heard uh, the pastor Tim Keller talk about when you're trying to talk about the idolatry of a particular world, you don't just come at them and say, don't do this, this is wrong, don't do it. But he would say, what's the idol of the of the Western world? Well, it's a sense of freedom, right? And so the, the real uh, theology that we have to be doing is saying, it, are the behaviors that you are doing in your life, are they leading to more freedom? So it, you definitely love your choices. You love that no one else would interfere with it. But now let's look at the data in your life and saying, is porn use interfering with you know, the freedoms that you desire relationally? Like, are you able to feel good about yourself? Are you able to, uh, you know, is it affecting... Uh, is it causing erectile difficulties? And so I think that's the framework. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if we knew that there was going to be just a hot button phrase that isn't crucial to diagnosis in that classical sense, I don't know why we keep defaulting to something that we know is just going to be, uh, you know, people are going to put a stiff arm up to it. But if we join in saying like, yeah, there's some behaviors that are unwanted dimensions of our lives, and what can we learn about these things? And we can all agree that, yes, mm. we can become overly conservative and stigmatized. But come on, let's also be honest that we can try and act like these big issues are not issues at all when they are clearly causing debris throughout society, exploitation, trafficking, porn-induced erectile dysfunction. Like, let's look at the science. Let's look at the data and say suppression and mindless indulging do not work uh, to bring us into the freedom that we desire and deserve. That's really helpful. In kind of modern Catholic philosophy, we make this distinction between, say, when we're looking at morality, we can look at it from a teleological point of view. Like, are we thwarting Mm -hmm. the ends for which this 
act is in yes. uh, yeah yes. but but then you can also look at it from a phenomenological point of view which is what mm -hmm. John Paul II did in his work on love and responsibility and it really does seem to strike the heart of modern man in a more powerful way you know it's like how are you experiencing this like so I love how you've done that like do you have unwanted behaviors why are they unwanted why is this something you'd like to stop yeah that that seems to be a much more helpful exactly. approach and that's Galatians 5, right? Like it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So it's not just freedom from porn use or freedom from addiction. It's we have to be able to say, what is the desire uh, that God has put in our hearts? And are we free to pursue those things? Or are there barriers, whether that is porn, uh, greed, uh, some form of idolatry that is pr inhibiting us from finding mm -hmm. those desires and that freedom. So, yeah, Archbishop Fulton Sheen once made that distinction between freedom from and freedom for. And he said, no one's ever gone up to a taxi cab driver and said, are you free? And when he says yes, you say, hooray for freedom. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we want to be free from constraint. And that where are we going? Be, yeah. Yes. Well, what's what's the point of our kind of sexual energies? All right. So, That's so great. OK, can you maybe help us kind of look at this in a deeper way? Because what you've said one mm -hmm. thing that I have repeated so many times because I found it so insightful. Correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but you said when we run from our shame, we legitimize its claims against us. Can you break that open for mm -hmm. me? For sure. So I think that's part of what I was getting at earlier when I said that, uh, you know, unwanted sexual behaviors are not random. They are a direct reflection of the parts of our story that remain unaddressed. And so let me let me back up by just kind of talking about some of the research that I did in this realm. So, uh, you know, a lot of the research that is out there basically reconfirms the you know, the issue that porn is a problem. So we know that 57% of our clergy, 64% of youth pastors are using it. We know that, you know, something like two thirds of church going men are using porn. I think it's like a third of all porn users are now women. A third of all people uh, of all marriages will be impacted by extramarital affairs. So most of the data out there basically just reconfirms like <laughs> there are sexual problems that exist. And so a lot of the research that I did was to really get curious about, you know, what were people's relationships like with their mothers and fathers? Uh, what were some of those adverse childhood experiences like trauma and sexual abuse? Uh, and then also we looked at what were people dealing with in their present day life? Like, did they have a lack of purpose? Were they struggling with depression, anxiety? And then we looked at some of the leading porn sites uh, keep track of what are the porn searches that you know people around the world are most likely to pursue. And so I took about 20 of those categories and put them all into the research instrument and had a team at New York University handle all the analytics with it. And we were just really curious about what we would find about the why. Um, and that's really what I'm obsessed with is why do we do these things? And part of what the data came back with is that uh, there is a relationship between our family of origin, uh, our past trauma experiences, and the sexual uh, behaviors that we pursue, but even more specifically than that, your uh, specific porn searches could be shaped, if not predicted, based in the unresolved parts of your story. And mm. I can get into kind of some of my own life and background with regard to how that works in, in my life. But to me, uh, this is the drum that I keep kind of banging is that this is really good news because mm. it means that your porn struggle is not a life sentence to addiction or to shame. It is a roadmap to healing. And so that is the importance of going back, not just to when did you start struggling with porn, but tell me some of those foundational moments in your family or in your middle school years where mm -hmm. uh, the voice of shame really began to solidify because we all know that shame might be a response to participating in a behavior that we're not fond of. But what I think we also need to begin to invite people to consider is if you believe that you are unwanted or unworthy of love or belonging, mm. you are very, very likely to pursue behaviors that confirm that core belief about who you are. The, and that... That confirm oh, that you're not it. wanted or that seek to address the yes. wound that you're not wanted? 
that's, I mean, that's another thing that I often, it might sound like splitting hairs in our field, but some people will say, well, I'm using porn to self-medicate wounds. And again, you will never hear me say that that is untrue. But I think the, the much more true thing is that if we believe that there's something foul, perverse, ugly, distorted, broken about who we are, uh, shame loves to find more and more data that convinces itself that that message is true. And so that's what I find, you know, over and over again is like, if you really press people of like, yes, you know that it's self-medicating from a fight in your marriage or, a, you know, self-medicating the wounds of childhood. But if you actually ask them, what is your existential feeling after you've participated in this thing for a thousand times? If they have any integrity, they'll tell you, I always feel like crap. Um, and so that's the real mm. message that I want to invite people into is why do you pursue behaviors that confirm uh, these really negative uh, beliefs about who you are. And so I think that's the the work of the gospel is to be wow. able to invite people into what are those stories of heartache, brokenness, that something of your family, something of the evil one has convinced you that, uh, you know, the image of God might be true for some people and at different times throughout your life, but definitely not in this instance. And then you begin to kind of feel like, you know what, there's, if people really knew who I was, um, they would never want anything to do with me. And then you have all of this data and all of this evidence, like here's exhibit A, B, and C in the court of law against myself. And so that's the message that I think we really need to invite people into healing is where did that message of shame really begin to find legitimacy? And then how do we turn and face that message of shame? I love your nuance. So is part of what you're saying that if pornography was merely about self-medicating, then when I'm finished, I would feel medicated, but I don't. I feel like trash. So something else is going mm -hmm. on here. That's This is the first yes, time like, I've really I, heard this. This is really cool. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a big issue in our field. And I again, it might feel like splitting hairs, but I think language matters, right? Um, the language that we use to define a problem, the language that we use to justify why we do what we do. And, and that's, you know, just even like when you think about Jesus's words in Matthew five, uh, Jesus talks about sin as the issue of lust, yes, which is adultery. But he also says those of you that are angry are guilty of murder. So right away, Jesus is saying, you know, the human heart is an adulterous heart, but it's also a murderous heart. And so I think, especially in Christian mm. communities, that sense of we have defined porn as an exclusively lust issue, but it's also an issue of anger. It's an issue of uh, power of, you know, in porn, I can get exactly what I want when I want it. And I can you know, use another person's body to atone for all of the crap and all of the heartache that I have been through in my life. And so again, is lust true? Absolutely. But is anger also in, in a desire for power and control also part of it? Yes. Um, and so same thing with regard to self-medicating is yes, we need something, um, some of the heartache of what we have been through both presently and in the past. But there's so much more to the story than that. And I think it's, it's, that, it's that danger of partial truths that is uh, so damaging to us when we're thinking about how do we define any particular area of problem. Wow. How do you help people look upon their own sin with um, curiosity and, and less judgment? Mm -hmm. Because I know, and you know why that's difficult for people to do, right? As soon as you say that to somebody, it they hear you saying pornography is not that bad, and you shouldn't feel that bad about it, which isn't what you're mm -hmm. saying. But help us understand that. Sure. So let me go into uh, you know part of the way that I invite people to conceive of their sexual life is just to imagine like it's late in the evening and you hear that familiar knock of lust come to your door. And just that question of like, what are you gonna do? And so maybe in the past you have some internet monitoring on your computer to try and keep uh, you know, negative websites at bay. Maybe you call a dear friend for backup. 
Uh, other days, if you're honest, you let something of that lust and that intruder just kind of come in and ransack various rooms of your house. And so part of what I would invite people into is what if you didn't try to suppress and also what if you didn't allow yourself to indulge, but instead you went out onto the front porch of your life and you began to ask your sexual life questions like, uh, I wonder why this porn search has been appealing to me since the time I was 14. Uh, what is this particular porn search trying to tell me about my life? Um, or maybe it's, why is it that whenever I am alone for more than 10 minutes, I lose my window of tolerance, I become pretty anxious, and then I attempt to soothe something of that anxiety with porn. I wonder what this is trying to tell me about how to find legitimate forms of soothing. And so just that sense of uh, be deeply curious about what these things might be revealing. So personally, I can remember uh, being in seminary. I was getting my MDiv and my master's in counseling at the time. I was doing a dual track degree. And uh, two stories come to mind. Uh, the first was that I was struggling with porn use. Uh, a lot of the porn use that I was going to involved mother oriented themes. And so was kind of deeply ashamed of that. Didn't feel like that was anything that I could ever tell. Like it's one thing to kind of tell people you know, I struggle with porn or have struggled with it. It's another thing to say I do struggle with it. And here's what I'm actually searching for. Yeah. And then in seminary, I also had uh, some friends of mine that referred to me as Candyman. And uh, the Candyman was essentially trying to say that whenever I presented myself relationally to people, I would always try and position myself as offering something of like emotional candy to women that were going through really difficult things in life. I would always ask the questions. I kind of always had this sixth sense for where boyfriends and husbands were not very attuned to their partners. And that's where I would position myself. So that would be kind of the context of my life in seminary, like feeling like a hypocrite, and at the same time, uh, having the style of relating with women that I found to be very problematic. So I get in to see a therapist and the, the first question that my therapist says is, you know, tell me about your role in your family. And I was, I mean, training to be a therapist, but so irritated with that question because I would have preferred she just said like, get some internet monitoring, get into some accountability groups, or maybe you should probably question your call to ministry. Like those yeah. options would have been much dear. But she asked me about my role. And Matt, here's the first scene that came to mind the moment she asked it. And I had never put these pieces together. Uh, my dad was a minister, a Presbyterian minister. And so, you know, probably 200, 300 person church. And so when people were going through a crisis, it wasn't like the pastoral counselor on staff, it was my dad. So they would try and reach him at the church. If they couldn't get a hold of him there, they would call our, our home. And it, my dad didn't have a cell phone at that time. And so the answering machine was like the original form of Netflix for me. So mm. uh, you get to hear all the issues of people, you know, what people are actually going through, not just on Sunday morning, but, you know, here's the problems, the mental health disorders, the porn use, the affairs that are happening within the church wow. body. And I'll never forget this moment where an elder's wife called and left a message uh, and she was in tears and had basically said, my husband just had an affair. And I remember watching my dad go into crisis mode. And then I remember seeing my mom uh, just become pretty angry that she was going to lose her husband for yet another night to ministry. Mm. And so that was often my job in my family was to get a sense of, okay, my dad needs to leave to attend particular things. And now uh, I might need to vacuum the house uh, to be able to help my mom out. I might need to be able to do dishes. I might need to engage my mom in a 20 or 30 minute counseling session, essentially to work, work through uh, how she was doing her anger, her disappointment and the ways that we could kind of help her think about this differently. And so that was, you know, very early age being groomed for something of a therapist in my in my world, but I think part of what my therapist was inviting me to put together is my mom had used me. 
Uh, she had used me for emotional gain. She had used me in the midst of the breakdown within their marriage. And that grief has to go somewhere. And so uh, I had never really stepped into yeah. the reality that I had not been mothered well. Uh, and so part of the appeal to that porn search was, well, here's, you know, in that genre of porn, here's a mother that feels very enthusiastic for a young man. And so that becomes something of the eroticism. But the porn industry is making massive amounts of profits off of triangulation and family systems and unaddressed trauma. And so that sense of I needed to address the grief with my own mom and how I was eroticizing that grief. But the other side to it is that I was deeply angry that the primary woman that God had put into my life to care, to care about my needs, to pursue things that were good for me had not done that and had kind of flipped the roles. And so again, porn use is deeply appealing to people who have unaddressed anger in their life. And so again, that's the intersection of Jesus and pornography is that, you know, porn says, come unto me, all you are who, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's also what Jesus says. Uh, mm. You know, the cross addresses the anger uh, the rage within me, the desire for atonement and propitiation, but so does pornography. Pornography says, you know, when you come to this uh, website, you bring all of that unaddressed trauma, all of the anger for anyone not coming through for you, and then you can demand someone else's compliance for you. And so I think that's the invitation to a more curious approach is, uh, the porn use that we are seeking out uh, is something like, you know, like a strand of DNA that's trying to tell us about mm -hmm. where we come from, some of the unaddressed ancestors within us. And so uh, hmm. that, that would be kind of my approach is, uh, you know, don't just fight against porn, fight to discover the connections between the porn that you're pursuing and some of those unaddressed stories within your life. Massively helpful. Um, I think one thing that I have been on guard against when I've been in sort of therapy-like sessions, and I imagine this, you know, I'm not unique, is this hesitation to uh, blame my parents, right? It's like, mm -hmm. and why? Well, one, because it feels just super cliche, you know, like uh, it's your dad, you know, it's a relationship with your yeah. dad or something. Uh, two, I know I'm supposed to take responsibility for my own actions. And so calling my mm -hmm. parents out seems to shift the blame. Three, I have kids. And if I can blame my parents, then what the hell will they say about me? And that doesn't make me feel good. So, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea that I might have to own some of the things I've put on my kids. And so I'd rather them... To, you know, do you see? So how, how do we begin to to look at family wounds without scapegoating our family? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I love about the Bible is that it holds this tension between honor and honesty. And so this notion of we know that Abraham is the father of our faith, someone that we revere, um, you know, who left everything in order to go into the land that God had called him to go into. And yet, what do we also know about him? Uh, he attempted to traffic his wife uh, at least twice. Uh, he was a bona fide coward. He's, you know, allowed for the assault of Hagar within his family and all of the abdication. And so I think that's really the invitation of scripture is that it says like, yes, we need to honor our mother and father, but do not believe that if you cannot be honest about what you have suffered in them, that that is any form of honor whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so I think Jesus kind of takes that even further. And he says, unless you hate your mother and father, you cannot follow me. And so what he's referring to is that, you know, it's this issue of loyalty. And some of us are very, very committed to being loyal to our parents, and therefore are not open to the grief of not being mothered or fathered well. And so God wants your relationship with your father. Why? Because he wants uh, to father you. You know, God wants in some ways for you to see some of your destituteness and your nakedness. Why? Because uh, he wants to clothe you with really good things. And so one of the, you know, the author, 
William Paul Young kind of said, you know, it took me all of 50 years to wipe the face of my father off of the face of God. And I think that's a very honest statement that in many ways, our fathers have left us hungering for a father. And that's not blaming them. Uh, that's just being honest. And so I think the you know, the core issue for us as parents is not the issue of rupture, but it's far more the issue of repair. And so all parents rupture, but only really good parents seek to repair those ruptures and to step into, mm. you know, here's part of my idolatry. Here's part of, you know, your compliance uh, was so needed in order to reflect positively on my family that I always framed your rebellion as problematic. But in many ways, you were something of a biblical prophet uh, that wanted nothing to do with my forms of religiosity. And so I think that's, that's the issue. It's like, did, did you, good parents are not those that just went to church Sundays and put food on the table. Yeah. Uh, good parents are those who really stepped into that phrase of Matthew 5 of like, there is an adulterous and a murderous heart within us. And if you didn't have a mother and a father really confess their desire for adultery and murder with regard to the family system, I would claim that you didn't really have parents uh, who were being. But, what you do know, you mean, formed. confess adultery and against the family system? Like, what is that? That sounds very intense. What does that look like? Yeah. So it would be that, you know, I, I think of my own kids. Um, I have a daughter who just turned seven, and I was wanting her to comply uh, to something that I was asking and became pretty entitled and angry with her. And so part of what she said back to me was, Dad, do you really want this to be the face of my father for the rest of my life? <laughs> this is the problem and of being a therapist, right? It came back uh, to you. Of giving kids language. And yes. that was that sense of something needed to, I mean, she was cornering me with a sense of uh, uh, adultery and murder, that sense of, uh, you know, adultery in that Matthew 5 is, is the desire for covetousness, that there is something that I desired. I didn't just lust for an affair, but I lusted for compliance. I was mm -hmm. coveting some level of this is the way that I want my family to look and to sound right now, and you are in the way of my uh, desire. So idolatry, when she yeah. did not... Yeah, when she did not come through with what I was desiring, I made her pay with a look that she rightly called out. And so I think that's what parents are all or children are always doing. If we're if we have eyes to mm. see and ears to listen, as they are, they're not pleased with uh, the nature of our hearts. And so I think that's I think that what a good parent does is. I'm not just going to ask for your obedience. I'm going to be able to say maybe some of your disobedience uh, is trying to convey a message to me about how things have, have been. So I'm not under the persuasion that you shouldn't give any kids, you know, no rules, no regulations. Like I'm not free range. I think good parenting is we need to be attuned and then we also need to be contained and offer boundaries to our kids but most of the time especially in religious households there's this overemphasis on containment and conformity yeah. at the cost of kind of attuning to what a child is actually trying to uh desire within the family I think another thing... Did that, we just go too deep into family systems right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was... It's really, it's really helpful. Um, yeah. Um, so I think another thing that prevents people from like looking into therapy or kind of owning up to the baggage of their, their home life growing up is they don't want to be whiny, you know? And mm -hmm. they say to themselves, the little things that I endured are really nothing compared to what other people mm -hmm. have endured. Their suffering is much worse than mine. So what am I going to do? Like pretend that time my dad looked at me funny is the reason why I'm looking at po It feels pathetic to say it. I'm not saying it is. It feels mm -hmm. that way. How do you get around that with your mm -hmm. clients? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think initially what I would say is like we should never try to compare trauma. Uh, the, in the twelve-step tradition, it's don't compare but identify. And so I think in, when you look at uh, some of my friends and colleagues, Dan Allender, Kathy Lorzell, just wrote a book called Redeeming Heartache. And so they're looking at the categories of kind of the orphan, widow, and the stranger uh, as kind of very you know core biblical categories, but also true of dimensions in our life. And so I think if we're really honest, that's what the Bible is inviting us into is, you know, it's not just that someone else has been orphaned, someone else has been widowed, or someone else has feel estranged. It's like <laughs> middle school is a prototype of hell. And so if you have not felt alien within middle school, uh, did you, <laughs> where did you go to middle school? Because I want to send my kids there. Uh, and all of us have sent, felt that sense of, yes, I had a mother and a father, but if I'm honest, there were maybe one or two places within my life where uh, I lacked a good mother and a good father. And I think that's what, you know, Matthew 5, 4 is saying of blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. I meet a lot of men that want the forgiveness of their poor new sins, but I don't meet many men who are actively seeking out comfort for some of the heartache in their life. And so I think that's when I see a lot of men really begin to change is that they're not dismissing their pain as inconsequential. They're not mm. comparing their trauma to another. Um, they're being able to say, yeah, there's some stuff in my life that bears heartache, that bears confusion. And when your soul can name what is true, the truth of that pain and the trauma will begin to set you free. And so that's, I mean, that's part of, it's always just an issue when people first get into treatment is, yeah, I don't want to be whiny. I don't want to complain. Uh, but I think, yeah, it, it's also, I don't want to change the foundation of my life because I've learned how to kind of flick yeah. stuff off my shoulder. I've learned a level of mastery in my own life. And so if you ask me to attend to trauma and to heartache, uh, I don't have my most reliable getaway car and no way mm. will I live life without mm. that. Yeah, it is strange. Back to what you said earlier about how shame seeks out data to sort of validate itself or something. I remember speaking yes. to a, a therapist um, and I was skeptical of these kind voices that were coming in, you know, mm. to say good things about me. Um, I thought, well, there's no way they can bloody well be true. So what the hell's this? You know, mm -hmm. I, I think maybe I'm just telling myself what I want to hear. And he, he gently be and beautifully pointed out that, you know, I've been journeying with you for a while and this isn't the thing you usually tell yourself. Like what you're usually telling yourself, what you seem to want to tell yourself is the opposite of these things. Um, it's, it's difficult to sort of lay down that defense and try to believe something different. It is. Yeah. And I think that that's part of, yeah, it's a, it's a good question of, you know, just that question of hermeneutics and how do we understand something? Like if, if you are hearing the voice of judgment and condemnation and contempt, I would propose that that is not the voice of God. And so, you know, I think God don't want to speak for God, cannot speak for God, but in the scriptures, that sense of, you know, after Adam has just eaten of the fruit, that he was commanded not to eat from, God comes to find Adam and says, where are you? Uh, to Hagar, who has just been traumatized by the first family of our faith, uh, out in the wilderness, uh, which in the text it reads like, you know, some spring on the road to Shur, and it sounds like something out of the four seasons, but it's much more like a truck on I-95 or I-5, like not the place that you want to end up in the ancient Near East. And it's in that place that the angel of the Lord shows up and asks two of the question, two of the best questions that I think can ever be asked of anyone's life, which are, where do you come from? The question of your past. And then where are you going? The question of your future. And so I think if we are hearing the voice of God with regard to our sexual struggles or relational struggle, I think that's something of the litmus test is, is that voice kind? Is that voice curious? Is it 
inviting you to deeper reflection about how that sorrow or that sin came to be. And if it's, come on, just get your act together. You should be over this. What is this? The 900th time that you've pursued this. Um, those are accusations. Mm. And we know who, that who is. is the Revelation accuser. 12, 10. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that's yes. kind of part of what we've lost in this sort of concerted effort to throw out Satan, the demonic, and hell. It's like, okay, so if that's mm-hmm. no longer on the table, what's left? Well, it's God and him failing to come through for me or me just being like, fundamentally incapable of getting my shit together. It's like, those are my options now. Um, But as you say, Satan is called the accuser of our brethren. And um, I remember hearing that the word paraclete is a word that means defense attorney. So um, Mm. yeah, yeah. So sin is the enemy. The demonic is the enemy. But I... I'm wanted by God, apparently. I don't, it's like Christianity is this beautiful story where God disagrees me, disagrees with me when I tell him I'm yeah. rubbish. Um, yes. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's so I mean, that, that to me is, I mean, I heard a seminary professor talk about this. So it's not, you know, my idea. I'm sure it's steeped in theology, but part of what he was saying is the parable of the prodigal son is not about the younger brother, it's about the older brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the ending of the parable, of that parable is really the question of will the older brother join the party we don't know uh and i think that's the invitation is uh he you know dan allender is this guy's name he says that uh repentance is returning to the party that god is throwing in your honor that's what repentance is and so many of us have have thought that repentance is feeling like shit. I'm glad to hear you say shit. I almost said it two or three times. And I was like, can I cuss on that <laughs> podcast? Um, but yeah, we, we have believed that repentance is feeling like crap about who we are. But the issue is that all sin, past, present, future has already been atoned for. So the real question in that parable is, are you going to party? Because all things are yours in mm-hmm. Christ Jesus. And so I think that is the freedom that the gospel offers is, you know, yes, wild living, I will go and find you. But after you come back, do you realize that the ring, the robe, the entire house uh, is yours? And mm-hmm. please come to the party uh, in order to find life, to find community, to find joy. And so I, I think so many of us wait outside of the party because we don't feel like we deserve to go in or we're really pissed off about mm-hmm. how uh, lavish God can be with his table invitations to people that we don't think should actually be at the party. Amen. Really beautifully said. Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear some examples of uh, what you what you shared earlier was beautiful about that sort of mother wound and the sort of pornography you were seeking out. I'd love to kind of hear mm-hmm. of some more examples. Um, I think in my own life, um, I my primary wound I think seems to be a rejection, and I won't get into mm. all of that. But so for me, what I started to discover was the pornography I would watch would be when a woman is being pleased, and uh, that mm-hmm. to me sort of I think and you tell me what you think. It's a bit of free therapy here. It, it seemed to be kind of validating that part of me that just felt like I'm just unwanted to use a term. Like I'm, I'm not lovable yes. actually. Like I, I'm not delightful. I can't, I'm kind of incapable of mm-hmm. causing delight. And again, I'm not going to get into all of, of mm-hmm. why I felt that way. But whereas when I used to watch pornography that would have that element in it, like that is what I wanted. You know, if I remember yeah. Yeah. years ago, clicking some pornographic video where the woman was expressing no delight and and I was just and I was just like so turned off by that and it, it, that, that was really sort of yeah anyway so feel free to speak to that but then to kind yeah. of give us some other example because okay. it's it's not always easy people just think no I just I just want to look at porn because it feels good and that's true yes. but partially true Yep. Uh, so let me let me go at 30,000 feet and then maybe zoom in to the example that you gave so uh, some of the examples that we looked at would be, you know, let's say we use the, it was the category of power over. And so it was, you know, did you want someone that was younger than you, a college student, you know, the teen search, uh, maybe a race that suggested to you some level of subservience. And so what we found about people who sought out that type of pornography was that they had uh 
fathers who were very strict. They were dealing with a, a lack of purpose in their life, and they had very high levels of shame. And so if we just play armchair psychologist for a moment, if you grew up in a family system that your father was very domineering, authoritative, uh, he specialized in creating powerlessness for you. And so the, you know, the root word of disciple of discipline is disciple, which means to teach. And so that's always the question of like when people are saying, well, what's the difference between like a rigid family and, and a home that actually honors discipline? Well, uh, Dis a disciplined family really helps kids to understand. It teaches them about their emotions. It teaches them about why they might be wanting certain things. It teaches them the reason for the law in the first place. It doesn't just kind of say, this is what our family does and you have to comply. And so if that was your early childhood, one of the appeals to that genre of pornography is that you get to reverse that situation. And now you are the one with power. You are the one that is able to get what you want. Uh, the issue of the lack of purpose, my research found men, especially dealing with a lack of purpose in their life, meaning they looked back at their life and saw a lot of failure. Uh, they looked back at their life and didn't like their careers or the direction that their life was taking. Those men were seven times more likely to increase their use of pornography. So to me, this goes back to the curse for a man in Genesis 3, that, you know, it's thorns, it's this thistles, it's the sweat of your brow. And so I think for, for most men, there is this baseline experience of futility that, yeah, I can write a decent book on sexual brokenness, but there's going to be a better one that comes out in a mm -hmm. year. Um, I can you know, work for 18 years to be able to rear my children, and yet maybe they don't honor God and follow God after. Uh, I can try and build this business, but then it eventually fades. And so I think for most men, there's this sense of futility that everything is actually going back to dust. And so pornography gives us this place where, uh, if, at least for, I think Pornhub says that the average male user is on there for like six to eight minutes, maybe mm. seven minutes. So for seven minutes, I don't have to feel like a failure. I can get exactly what I want. Um, that's really powerful if the background of your life is a lack of purpose. And so uh, that would be one example. The yeah. other example, just for the sake of time, would be uh, the mother-oriented theme or maybe a boss, uh, someone older than you with more authority. We found that those men and women tended to have uh, parents who emotionally confided in them, so like an enmeshed family system. Uh, they had more of a history of childhood sexual abuse, and they were dealing with depression in their life. And so same thing, try and think about the strategy that if I feel best in life, I might outsource that healing, that soothing to someone older, more beautiful, that can kind of come to me and soothe me and kind of make me feel okay. Uh, if my past involves sexual abuse and a template of someone with more that is older with more power and authority uh, initially grooming me to feel pleasure. Well, I might reenact that pattern in the porn use to try and repeat something that is really familiar to me. And so again, the last thing I want to do is to create an encyclopedia of this sure. is what this is your porn search and this is what it says about you. But I think truth is in like, as we grapple with scripture, as we tell our stories in community, yeah. uh, we're going to learn things about why we're doing. And to your point, Matt, like I know nothing about your story, not going to push back on what you're saying, but I think a lot of people believe something about their themselves that is fairly convenient. And so, I mean, the, the few examples of it uh, that I've kind of been introduced to your work is that it, it, you are a desirable person. Like people want to listen to you. They want to understand. They want to learn from you. They want to be in community with you. And sometimes if that is the role that we play in our family, we can have a lot of envy uh, from maybe a mother, a father, other 
uh, siblings in our life. And so it can become a more convenient interpretation for, for me to just believe that there's nothing good about myself. Because if I actually own that, I actually have talents that God has given to me, that becomes much more problematic because now I have to deal with the world of envy. And so in porn use for someone like that, the porn use can become you know, this sense of I'm not willing to see uh, how much pleasure and desire I can bring to the world. Um, I want to believe a lie about myself. But then the truth of porn is that you get to kind of play out some scenario where you're actually bringing pleasure because mm. you cannot actually own that you mm. bring pleasure and goodness to others. So that is true. It, and wow. the other thing that you said could completely be true as well, that if I feel like I have the shame-based identity of there's nothing good about me, I don't want to do the hard work to be able to offer love to myself, to understand and grapple with the gospel. It's just easier to outsource that to something else. And clinically, narcissism is not being full of oneself as we've classically understood it. Narcissism is not knowing who we are. And so therefore we look to an image or something else to reflect back to us our worth. And so whether that is, you know, Mercedes symbol, the amount of books we've written, uh, the amount of men or women that are interested in us sexually or intellectually, all of those things become shortcuts to try and validate who we are. And so you know, I'm presenting two different models that mm -hmm. one is we don't believe the truth of our beauty. And then the other is that we don't uh, do the really hard and necessary work to develop an identity outside of a reflected sense of self. And most men, I, I would say, need to do work on both areas. But usually we have one or the other issue at play. I just if had, you were envied yeah. and you, oh, go for it. Go no, for you're it. fine. Finish your thought. It, if if you were often the golden child within your family, or uh, you were very likely envied in your family, and so just that sense of, you know, are you ready to step into the war of you had a mother who desired you, had greater intimacy with you than she did with her own spouse, and that husband... Uh, both liked that you had a very close relationship with your mother, but also be, he liked it because he could kind of go off into work. He could have his realm of mastery and career. But then he also in some ways made you pay hmm. because wow. uh, of the intimacy that you had with his wife. And so that hmm. both can be true. And so that's the uniqueness of stepping into our story and our family <laughs> of origin, oh. uh, because we never quite know what we're going to find once we get into it. I had this image as you were talking about how of Lord of the Rings, right? And we want the eagles to take us to and from Mordor. We don't we don't want to do the hard yes. work. So it's like I would much rather you tell me that there's an app for this. Like the idea of having to look into my history. Like are you kidding? Like it just sounds so messy. And besides, I might start chasing down trails based on your or some other therapist's suggestion that go nowhere. This is exhausting. And yet you're telling me that this is what we got to do. Exactly. And I, I'm, I'm so glad that you referenced that. I mean, I, I feel the same thing with like sleep and body from time to time. It's like, you know, I, give me like a pill that I could take that would just eliminate sleep. Don't let me look at, yeah, I had a, I had a great IPA last night and I know that that affected my sleep. Um, but I would rather just do whatever I want during the day, take a pill, and then just deal with it. It's I don't like want to look Homer, at lifestyle choices. It's <laughs> Homer Simpson. I don't know if you remember that episode of The Simpsons where Homer says, that's tomorrow Homer's problem. Like, that's not my problem. That's his problem. <laughs> yes. One of the best lines <laughs> in television. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, okay, but, yeah, so, the, did you, like... Fair enough. Yeah. So we, we, I love that. That's a really good analogy. I don't have to have to go to sleep or one day could we come up with a pill where we no longer have to go to the bathroom? I mean, think of how much time is wasted on the bathroom. So we come up with these very unnatural, unhuman supposed remedies. But uh, 
Yeah, we're gonna have to do the human work. Okay, all right, so someone's watching this right now and they're convicted. Are you saying to them that they have to go see a therapist to begin this sort of journey? Are you saying it's optimal if they do? What? I am, I'm a therapist, so you should be highly suspicious of everything I say, because um, every profession is a bully. And so we need, truth is found in various perspectives. But I would say like therapy is one of the best investments that you can ever make in yourself to understand mm -hmm. your patterns, to understand and interrogate some of your motivation, to build a new foundation of your life, to extend a much more kind and curious approach. So yes, uh, love that. But also, I don't think that, you know, the therapist uh, is the only place of truth or uh, health. And so I think of healing as like a river. And if you look at something like the Mississippi River, that is so powerful, not just because it's the Mississippi, but because it has many different tributaries like the Missouri, the Arkansas, mm -hmm. the Tennessee. I, I get lost after that. But I think it, we need to be thinking about healing as, as, a, as a river no different than the Mississippi. And then to be able to say, what are the different streams and tributaries of your healing? And mm -hmm. yes to prayer. Yes to community. Yes to therapy. So it's not a either or. It's a if there is truth and goodness out there and beauty, go and find it. And so I I would go you know self care as one psychotherapist. I can't remember her name. Maybe it's Brianna Weist. Uh, she says that true self care is building a life that you don't constantly need to escape from. It's not about chocolate mm. cakes and salt baths. She says it's about building a life that you don't need to escape from. So that's oh, a tributary of healing. Terrific. Is what what is a life of joy and beauty that you don't need to escape from in porn? But that, also that's you precisely likely... that's precisely it. Like I, 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 it's funny, Jay. When I was a teenager, it was huge into video games, and I really liked it. I have fond which ones? Them. Well, I'm how old are you? I'm thirty nine, so. I'm 39 too. Shut up. 83, baby. Yeah. Awesome. 83. Uh, yeah. What month? Well, oh, July. July. Shut up. 16th. No. Eight. Amazing. We Eight are days, eight days apart. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. So I was into like Red Alert, Doom, Duke Nukem. Yes, totally. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I, I, yeah, I have fond memories. Like my friends would get together, we'd stay up, we'd like eat chocolate, play games, laugh. Like it, it's funny, I tell my wife that I really enjoy get that. Jolt like, or Mountain Dew? Uh, well, this was Australia. So we had like Farmer's Union, okay. nice coffee and other things. But I remember telling my okay. wife this and she's like, oh, that's so sad. I'm like, no, I, I really don't think it was. Like I really think it was a nice, anyway, point is this. Uh, now I'm 38 or nine, I have all here. Uh, nine and I'm trying to get back into video games and I think part of it mm -hmm. is like I want to just not exist for a while I want to mm -hmm. be as mm -hmm. absorbed in this game as I was when I was a teenager but it's not working and I'm kind of a little frustrated mm -hmm. like I, I want to get fully immersed in a game and just mm -hmm. sort of lose myself in that dissociate as it were and uh, it's not really working yes. which is yes. frustrating to me I'm like oh gosh I guess I have to go read a book or something else but but this it idea is, of I just yeah. want to not exist for a while. Yeah, I, I mean, I had the same thing uh, with books, which I mean, different seasons of my life. I had like a Call of Duty phase in grad mm -hmm. school where I was like, I just don't want to deal with this. And I remember going to bed with that sense of like a headshot uh, of just being <laughs> able to. And that was I mean, it wasn't so much about killing someone as much as like, here's just something like, here's a target and I can hit it. Uh, and then it, earlier this summer was going through just a bunch of deep questions about what's next with career and life. And so I just got completely immersed in like the book 1776. And then I read Boys in the Boat and this book called Unbroken. But it was like uh, these three pretty significant books within a week. And I was like, I do not want to be dealing with my life. I just want to be immersed in someone else's story. And I think, again, we don't need to stigmatize that, but it's to be able to say, well, what is actually happening in our life that we don't want to really deal with? And who are the people, uh, good friends, therapist, mentor, that we can kind of bring some of those questions, the confusion, and also bless that there can be 
intentional dissociation, which sounds paradoxical, but just that question of, I'm going to go into a book to be in another world for the next 30 to 42 minutes uh, and to be able to make that allotment without a sense of this isn't to numb, but it is to be able to be somewhat intentional with I need a reprieve from some of the difficulty of my life. But then, I mean, some of that's OK, surely, like surely the, the mm-hmm. surely what we're not saying is what you need to be able to do is sit down in a dark room quietly until your next duty. No. That's so so how do we know that we're kind of it's, using these entertainments in a healthy way? Well the I mean the platonic ideals like when we theology has kind of always been concerned with the sense of the true, the good and the beautiful. But it, from what I've read like the way that Plato first understood that was that it's much more the question of beauty which leads us to goodness which eventually leads us to truth. And so a lot of times we think about like things that we're supposed to be doing like we're supposed to be in the truth of the word or we're supposed to be in the truth of community or in the truth of something. And it's not compelling to us and to what our mm. brains and our bodies are feeling. So I think it's that question of beauty mm. of where when was the last time that you you felt something of the goodness of your body. And so maybe it was that hike up a mountain. Maybe it was that time that you rode a bike. When was the last time that you saw beauty? And you might think back to fly fishing. You might think back to uh, just like your favorite mountain, lake, or stream. And so I think that would be part of the invitation Mm. is, you know, what do you find beautiful? Because you are not the author of your heart. Someone put that desire for that type of beauty in there. And that is what following God is about, is being able to honor the heart that God has given to you. So it's got to be just back to what you were we were talking about earlier with it's not just freedom from Mm. but it's a sense of what is your freedom for and maybe some days you need a mountain other days you might need a spa or a bath and some like a really good set of headphones to listen to some of the most beautiful music you can find so it's that sense of how do i curate goodness and beauty in the midst of significant seasons of upheaval, of trauma, of heartache and boredom in our lives. I'll wrap up here, but Thomas Aquinas, who I'm a massive fan of, he has five remedies for sorrow in his giant work, the Summa Theologiae. And the fifth remedy for sorrow is sleep and baths, which is terrific. (laughs) And he like he writes syllogistically. He gives reasons for why he says this, but it's just I believe it to the point of self care. And am I re- is this action rejuvenating me, or do I leave it more tired? Yeah. Okay, yes. I- I'll let you go. But fi- yes. final question: um, How can people learn more about you? I- I'm going to link to your book, Unwanted. Um, I know you have a course which I'd like you to talk about. But then finally, mm-hmm. maybe like how where should somebody look if they want to get into therapy? Mm-hmm but maybe they're a little nervous about who who they're seeing, you know? Sure. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that last sentence made yeah, sense. So, the point I was trying to say is so, like, they're afraid, you know, like they'll go to somebody and that person will say, it's okay to masturbate or it's okay to look at pornography in moderation or something. So how, how do they find the right therapist? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So part of what I would say to that is, yeah, my website is uh, jay-stringer.com. And on that website, there's a lot of resources. I, I took the research instrument that I built for Unwanted and turned it into a self-assessment that you can take. And so the design of that self-assessment uh, is to really invite you to consider it's like some compass heading. So you'll go through about 160 questions. You'll answer wow. questions around your arousal template, your mother, father, <laughs> uh, various places of trauma. And then the instrument is going to generate a report and says, here are some themes that you might want to consider. And that might be a good report to take to a dear friend, to a therapist of being able to say, I wonder if there are some connections between this unresolved problem and some of the difficulties Mm. in my life. So uh, that assessment is there. I'm on Instagram is probably the place on social media that I'm most active. And so try and offer a lot of resources, understandings for people to get it uh, in ways that are free. Uh, And then the journey course uh, was 
It's an 18 week study into basically trying to understand your sexual story and understand kind of where you come from in order to shape where you want to go. So we did it in partnership with a film called The Heart of Man uh, that came out back in, I believe, 2018. And so that was really our desire to build a curriculum that could be used in churches and in a lot of recovery communities uh, and in a lot of small groups. So if you know that there's like uh, some people use it as a self-study, but then if you know that there's two or three other people that might be interested in learning more about like a narrative based approach of outgrowing porn, I strongly encourage you to check out the journey course. But there are so many resources out there. And sometimes it's, it's not just my approach, but it's, it's learning from like, you know, who are two or three guides that are going to help you kind of walk this mountain, because I think I have a really valuable approach to all this, but I am blind in a lot of areas as well. And so I think it's that sense of pay attention to like two or three people that you really resonate with their perspective because that resonance is really Mm -hmm. trying to invite you to the path of healing. And so I hope unwanted is part of it, but Aquinas would also be a very good guide on the journey and taking baths. So uh, we need a lot of people. So check out my resources, but also don't be loyal to my resources. I love it. Thank you, Jay. Yeah.